Well, Melanie, thank you very much indeed for giving me some more time for another conversation here in London. My honour and pleasure. Well, thank you. Uh, when we last talked, there were a couple of things that uh, led me to think I'd love to talk again, an update on your writing, and the other is 12 months on Brexit and what it means for Britain. But to come to the writing, uh, firstly, I'd seen and read a lot of your current affairs material and what have you, but I'd not read uh, this book or any of the others you've written. This is Guardian Angel, My Journey from Leftism to Sanity. Uh, and I actually read it on a three-hour train trip after you gave it to me. It's incredibly powerfully written. Uh, it's incredibly engaging. It's loaded with powerful argument. And it's a compelling read. Well, it's kind of you to say so. Thank you. Well, um, what else have you written? that we should know about? Uh, well, when I wrote, uh, that book was published, Guardian Angels published in America um, last year. And shortly after that, um, the same publisher in America brought out my first novel, uh, which is called The Legacy, um, and which is about um, anti-Semitism. It's about uh, fractured Jewish identity in Britain. It's about the pull of history. Um, and it's about what makes us, um, what makes us uh, have a sense of our own identity and how difficult that can be sometimes. And when I wrote that, um, I didn't quite realise quite how timely it would be. But you know, in Britain, uh, we are in the throes still of epidemic anti-Semitism and the inability to control it, which we might uh, talk about. And I wrote the novel because. Um, uh, it, it, I find it very difficult to get published. Um, these books are both published in America. Uh, for the last two decades, no mainstream British publisher has wanted to publish me. And I thought I would, you know, uh, try something a bit different um, on the basis that uh, in many respects there's more truth in fiction um, because you can get at deeper truths um, and present them in a way which engages people uh, uh, to a significant degree. So those are the two most recent books that I've written um, and I'm now um, you know, girding myself to write some more. Well, I certainly recommend this one and I look forward to reading the other. But now, Melanie, um, people often ask me on those occasions when I get asked to talk at a political rally or whatever it happens to be, what do I think are the greatest challenges confronting us in Australia, I think I probably give three broadly. One is that we no longer understand that you have to have a good debate if you're able to get good policy. We don't know how to debate, we don't know how to respect one another and treat one another properly to get the best results, negotiate our way forward. Uh, another is uh, that uh, I think so many children now go through an education system that doesn't expose them to a range of views and help them to think rather than respond to their feeling. And another is that I think we have a dad crisis. Now that's a controversial thing to say, but you in your description of your journey from leftism to sanity said that you really struggled with the way that the left, which had always been a fierce defender of family, started to abandon that position. And I don't want to sound insensitive to people who are struggling with this issue in good conscience, and we all know none of us are perfect. Nonetheless, we have to, I think, be prepared to talk honestly about what really works. For sure. Now, I wanted to read a little of what you actually said. Uh, you talked about some serious work done uh, back in the early 90s by two social scientists, Norman Dennis and George Erdos. Now, according to this report, there was incontrovertible evidence that Children in fractured family units tended to die earlier, suffer more ill health, do less well at school, were more likely to be unemployed, more prone to criminal behaviour and to repeat as adults the same cycle of unstable parenting. Now it created uproar, as you put it, uh, not just because of what it said, but, but who was saying it. The publisher was uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs, seen as right wing, but the authors were from the left. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the social science establishment, as you put it, circled the wagons. One distinguished academic claimed the author's research was old, out of date, selective and misleading. Well, I'd have to say 30 years on, there's not much support for his position. We now know, more graphically than ever, if we look at it, what happens when family structures go wrong. 
But you say you rang this expert to ask what the research actually said, but when pressed, he wouldn't answer the question. Instead, he released a stream of invective, calling the author's mental faculties into question and asking emotionally, what do these people want? Do they want unhappy parents to stay together? He eventually admitted that the authors were actually correct as far as the research was concerned. But he asked rhetorically, where had that got anyone? Nowhere. Was it possible to turn back the clock? Of course not. And why were they so concerned about the rights of the child? What about the rights of the parents? What has happened that it's acceptable to ignore evidence when it impacts on others, particularly our own children? Well, what that academic went on to uh, not say, which I found out, uh, was that he was divorced. And he was consumed, it seemed to me, by guilt about what he had done to his children. And what uh, I found at that time was that uh, for a variety of reasons, and we have to sort of think ourselves back to a time which was quite different from today when, you know, uh, lifestyle choice hadn't really been properly invented. It was being invented. Um, and what was happening was that these people who were responsible for producing apparently, ostensibly objective research were themselves caught up in these family dramas. They were themselves becoming divorced. They were themselves having children who were becoming divorced. Um, and they couldn't bear the disconnect between the objective reality and their own family situation. So they made the objective reality fit their subjective feelings. They twisted it. And I watched this happen. Um, and I watched academics who were committed to the truth get denied grant funding because they said things which were unsayable about family breakdown. And I found that there was an almost impossible task in elaborating upon these objective facts, this objective evidence, without immediately being accused of being horrible personally to people. I was set upon by people who said, how dare you call into question what I have done because I've done the best for my family. I've tried my best with my children. And I would say, I didn't even know you were divorced. I'm not making any aspersions about individuals. Individuals cope the best they can with a variety of difficult circumstances. Many people who are divorced or who have uh, are bringing up children on their own do an absolutely magnificent job. They go to enormous and heroic uh, ends, e efforts, to protect their children. But nevertheless, it seems to me that these are situations of disadvantage. And isn't it better to try to avoid disadvantaging children uh, wherever possible? In other words, we can't possibly entertain policy making which deliberately exposes children to disadvantage on the basis that it makes their parents happy because we should surely put our children first. And when one's dealing with public policy, one has to deal with the reality as it affects the vast majority of people. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not sympathetic to individuals going through these hard things. Well, those arguments went nowhere at all. The subjective ruled. Uh, my personal feelings trump the objective evidence. And this was part and parcel of something that I only realized after many years that what was happening was not confined to this very emotional issue of the family, which clearly had emotional ramifications because people were personally bound up with this issue. What was happening was that the very idea of objective evidence was being cast aside because it was too inconvenient when it got in the way, what people wanted, how they wanted to live their own lives. And as the years went on, it seemed to me that not only was evidence being cast aside, not only was apparently objective evidence by university researchers becoming subjective and warped and wrong and false, but the very idea of evidence was being overturned. The very idea of rationality and reason were being dismissed. And this was all part and parcel of what only appeared to me to be the case after many years, that on issue after issue after issue, 
family lifestyle choice, um, multiculturalism, um, deep green environmentalism, um, moral relativism, moral and cultural relativism, and all those isms, they were all ideologies. And the point about an ideology is that the idea is sacrosanct. Nothing can get in the way of the idea. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that all the, these ideologies were utopian. They were all predicated on a belief basically in the perfection of the world. So multiculturalism would eradicate prejudice from the human heart completely. Um, it would stop war. It would stop conflict. Lifestyle choice would eradicate bigotry and uh, the bigotry over differences in people's lifestyles. So no longer would people look down on people who were divorced or, or single parents and, and all that kind of thing. They were all utopian. Deep green environmentalism was about saving the planet from frying and just being destroyed completely. So anyone who disagreed with these ideologies, anyone who said, well, actually the evidence shows this is wrong, factually wrong, that couldn't happen because the ideology couldn't be gainsaid. And because these ideologies were all to do with the perfection of the world, anyone who spoke against them was not simply wrong, they were evil. And it couldn't be said because it was such an evil thing. And so you found that evidence became politicized. It became called right-wing, ultra-right-wing, and all the rest of those epithets. And it became unsayable. And the people who dared to say it found themselves bullied and ostracized and persecuted and removed from their social, uh, all that, they, 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 they lost their friends, they lost their professional advancement, they were threatened with their jobs, some of them lost their jobs. And so you have a situation we have today. And the reason I wrote that book, um, The Guardian Angel, was because what had happened to me in my professional life uh, when I started out, I worked for nearly 20 years for Guardian newspapers, the very heart of this liberal universalist ideological perspective. And what happened to me over that period was as I, I, I fell foul of that world uh, very badly. But what happened to me seemed to me to, to, to illustrate what had happened to the West, what happened to Britain and to the West. And so through the the story of what happened to me issue by issue, I could actually tell a bigger story of what happened to us in the West. Well, it seemed to me that the reason that I pointed that out, because I think it's fair to say that's where you started to realise that your political position of choice was moving away from you, is that it's in the area of something as critical as looking after our children that if we won't accept the evidence that points to the ideals for our children, I don't want to sound insensitive about this, people work different journeys, but there's no doubt about it. Just as we know what's healthy and what's not, we all try to eat sensibly because we're told we know what eating sensibly is. We all try to keep fit because we know that's important, but you're not even allowed to talk about what the ideals are for our children anymore. If we won't do it there, where will we respond to the evidence? Well, we don't. We collectively no longer respond to evidence. Once we you've have opened that door written to it the out. people that we ought to nourish and cherish hmm. and care most about, the vulnerable kids who haven't got a voice, yeah. if we won't listen to the evidence for their best interests, where will we? Well, indeed. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not just children. Um, uh, the whole breakdown of family has impacted on everybody, men, women and children. Women have suffered greatly, and it's it's ironic because women have been in the forefront of opening this whole can of worms of lifestyle choice uh, in the interests of freeing themselves from men. That's sort of alt, the ultra feminist uh, point of view. But uh, anecdotally, this tells you everything that you need to know. Um, I can't recall quite when it was, but let's say in the somewhere around the 1980s, maybe uh, possibly the 1990s, a set of information disappeared completely from the British government's research archive. Uh, that information used to tell us, there used to be statistical information to tell us of the relative rates of abuse to women and children from different types of family background. 
And as I recall, I'm speaking from memory because these figures are no longer accessible. They're no longer, they're no, no longer even f collected. But as I recall, the level of abuse, both physical and um, sexual, of both women and children from uh, broken families where there was no uh, married uh, father uh, on board was something like 33 times what it was in a married household, 33 times. So, you know, women and children faced that level of suffering as a result of the very situation that women were in the forefront of bringing about. Those figures were no stopped being collected because it was discriminatory against non-married households. And there could be no indication that there was any disadvantage that information was censored out of existence in Britain. So nobody now knows. Nobody can tell. I can't tell you what the statistical likelihood is of a woman being beaten up by living in a household of transient men. I can't tell you. Those figures no longer exist. Um, and so that's what we've done. We've, 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 we've really, um, we've, we, we've made uh, evidence and truth illegitimate because it, may conflict with our ideological belief that a particular policy, course of action, way of life is unarguably correct. This is a terrifying situation. I mean, there was a term, a, a, a phrase termed by a man called Talmon, and I think the, I've forgotten when, maybe the 50s, um, he called it cultural totalitarianism. That's what we're living through. Interesting that you talk about the research not being there. There are parallels for that in Australia. There was some work done in South Australia that's impossible to find now, which showed that uh, single mothers were in danger of being abused by their teenage sons in the absence of a satisfactory father relationship as well. And again, sensitive, not popular, not what people want to talk about, but who are the victims? children and in fact, in the end, women. Exactly. Um, and the costs, of course, are enormous. Uh, the statistics in our country of youth anxiety and of depression and indeed of suicide are frightening and depressing in themselves. Here in Britain, I'm told that uh, there are estimates that the cost of family breakup could be costing the taxpayers as much as 48 million a billion pounds a year. Yeah, it's it's possible. I mean, I don't know what the figures are, but they are they they've always been um, when research is permitted. <laughs> um, they always were astronomical. Hmm. What is the role of the media in this? A free media, they protest uh, loudly whenever their their, their their freedoms look to be in their eyes threatened. But I've always thought a free media needed to be one that was not enslaved to a narrow worldview as well. Yes, I mean, I'm very torn on this, being a journalist, and I do passionately believe um, that the media is um, essential for the life of a democracy, keeps everybody honest. But the media has become dishonest, um, and it's a, it's a real problem. Um, the media uh, in Britain, and I expect it's the same in Australia and throughout the West, the media is basically uh, the public arm of the intelligentsia, the universities. Um, and the universities have gone rotten. The universities should be, and historically always, always were, the crucible of enlightened thinking, uh, where there's a free and unfettered play of ideas, uh, where people can say what they want, um, and where people learn from argument, robust argument in which ideas are tested out to destruction. And that's gone in the universities, broadly, in the humanities. Argument, reason, rationality, evidence has been uh, replaced by propaganda, insult, and the shutting down of debate. Now, that's the climate which has shaped the, uh, the worldview of our media. In fact, before the universities, I would say that in Britain, the school system, and I, I wrote about this, I've written about this in Guardian Angel, I watched it happen from the 80s onwards. Um, the school system turned itself from the, uh, uh, the idea that education 
was about the transmission of a culture down through the generations in order to, um, to perpetuate that culture. Um, it turned very explicitly uh, from that into a denigration of the culture on the basis the culture was itself illegitimate because it was white, it was colonialist, it was capitalist, it was racist, it was oppressive, and therefore children had to be taught to hate it and they had to be taught to despise it and to, and, and, and to, and to not know about it. So that translated into the university meltdown and that has produced our media. Our media, you know, are educated people and that's the problem. They've been de-educated. So you have the media um, hunting in a pack um, and uh, with some exceptions, obviously, but broadly, um, it's almost impossible to find platforms to really challenge these ideological shibboleths, which are basically propaganda and lies, uh, on issue after issue. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to find newspaper editors who either are um, themselves free of it enough and, and are brave enough to run with this. Um, and so the media has become part of the problem. Instead of keeping us honest, um, they have been a very large uh, element in recent years of making us dishonest. David Goodhart has this very interesting tool, I'd call it, for understanding why Western societies are coming apart. And in the context of Brexit, he talks about around half or a bit more of the population being somewheres mm. and around 25% being anywheres. They're mm. the sophisticated people who have been through universities. Yeah. Amazingly, don't seem to vary much in their worldviews. They're pretty consistent in them. But the somewheres, mm -hmm. which is as we saw in Brexit, still at least half the mm -hmm. country. It, that's a crude breakup, I know, but yeah. the point, I think, stands. Feel that they've not been heard or respected, mm -hmm. that the anywheres have had the policy say on mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. for a very long time, which surely points to the enormous danger of not seeking to understand what your fellow citizens are really thinking and really saying. Well, the danger uh, is that you break up the culture um, because um, uh, the result or the outcome of the uh, anywhere's philosophy is that there is no nation. Um, you don't defend the nation because the idea of a particular culture is in itself illegitimate. So everybody ends up um, ostensibly uh, supporting the brotherhood of man, which is a utopian and impossible uh, ideal. But in practice, what it means is if you no longer have a situation where the nation is bound by a shared sense of purpose, national purpose, a shared culture, so everybody basically knows there's an overarching structure to which they belong, to which they give allegiance, for which they're prepared to die if necessary. If you don't have that, then you don't have a community at all. What you then have is what we now have increasingly, which is um, society breaking down into interest groups which fight each other for power and privilege. Uh, you have a war of all against all, uh, which is ugly, it is uh, vicious, it is intolerant, it is authoritarian, it creates enormous numbers of casualties, it is cruel, it is everything that the so-called progressives believe themselves to be opposed to, but which they have actually ushered in. And so what we now have over the Brexit fight is a war to the death over these two views of the world. One view of the world is, as you suggest, um, uh, half the population, a little bit more than half, who voted for Brexit, what they were voting for, was to have a, a, a situation in which they could democratically rule themselves as a nation bound together by a common culture which found its expression in laws they passed through their national parliament which could not be overturned or was, would not be subject to any foreign interference. That's what a nation is, independent, sovereign. 
And it comes to the, it come, all boils down to the fact that they appreciate, love, want to cherish, want to continue and protect and defend this idea of a shared national experience, which everybody's bound together. That doesn't mean you can't be different within that, but it means that there is a common shared project called a nation. That's what people wanted. And that is absolute anathema to the progressive ideals uh, of uh, universalism, in which the very idea of a particular culture based on particular moral precepts is anathema because it is particular and therefore excludes, according to this dogma, everybody else. So you can't have a situation in which not everybody in the world can immediately share it. And consequently, you must destroy it. And as a result, the nation is illegitimate. And as a result, anybody who voted for that in Brexit is themselves illegitimate. Mm. They themselves must be racist, xenophobic, and so on. And so the nowheres think that the people who voted for Brexit are basically troglodytes and therefore can be completely ignored. Their view counts for nothing. They say so because it's oh, I've, racist. I've heard it. I've heard people say that. Right. So what, you see it in America. So too. what they're writing off is the essence of democracy. Yes, that's right. That's it's what they're writing off. Many of my fellow citizens' views are so illegitimate yeah. that they shouldn't be but, allowed to have their say. But you can see from their point of view why mm. they have to stop this. Because, first of all, they purported to stand for everything good in the world. And that anybody who stood against that view of the world was um, just not really entitled to be part of society at all. They could be written off. Deplorable. Now you can Deplorables. De de deplorable. Mm. But you can do that with a few people. You can do it with a few hundred people. You can do it with a few thousand people. But 52% uh, of the population, what, they're all racist? They're all xenophobic? So this can't, this can't be. So in, the, so in the liberal progressive Remainer mind, they were all misled. Okay, they were all misled. They were all stupid, therefore. They're all stupid. But they have to be stopped. They have to be stopped. And consequently, we have now this tremendous battle, uh, which is unprecedented in my view. Um, I think I said to you before that in my view, Brexit, you know, what was analogous in the revolutionary nature of what was being, what was happening in the challenge to this dominant progressive liberal universalist worldview was equivalent to the 17th century civil war here. And I think that more and more, because what we've had since I spoke to you last is the phenomenon of the democratically elected parliament of this country which happens to be stacked overwhelmingly with people who, with MPs who wanted to remain in the EU, trying to thwart the will of the people, the opinion of the people that they wanted to leave the European Union, an opinion which the Parliament had decided to give the people to make and had undertaken and promised to the people, we will observe what you say, we will enact it, and they went to the country, they fought an election on the basis that they promised that they would enact Brexit because the people had spoken. And then you found a situation in which Parliament has tried to stop that. And so you have a democratic crisis. In the 17th century, it was Parliament versus the King. Yes. Now it is Parliament, Parliament versus the people. Which is very frightening. And that is a terrifying situation. Mm. And that has caused this crisis in the middle of which we now are. And who knows how this is going to yeah. end? This is a very important thing, I think, for us all to understand. Uh, in Australia, for example, we don't have Europe saying we need to do away with boundaries. That's the only way we'll ever live peacefully. So the nation state idea should go. So it's hard for us to understand fully just how deeply this runs here. It is about yes. people feeling yes. that they want democracy. They yes. want the right to be and heard. And you see, the Remainers say it's not about democracy. Mm. They say we support democracy because we are parliament. Um, but And the people only voted for Brexit because they're racist and nasty and, and all terrible things like that. To which the, the people who voted Brexit say, well, excuse me, we were voting for democracy. And not only were we voting for democracy, but in trying to thwart our vote, 
you are being absolutely undemocratic. So as far as the Brexiteers are concerned, um, the fight is about, it's, it's, it's gone beyond Brexit now. Yes. It's a fight about democracy. Yes. Yeah. Is the will of the people ultimately sovereign mm. in a democracy? I understand that. Or That's, is it not? And it's important to understand. That's the issue. That's what it's come to. And the people understand that now. Yes. A number of Remainers understand it. Yes. People who voted Remain, there are many people who voted Remain out of very understandable reasons. Mm. They were they, they thought that Britain couldn't make it alone. Yes. They thought the downside exceeded the upside, mm. and so on. Very, you know, I, I have no problem with people arguing mm. that because there's, you know, there's a lot of, of, of common sense on their side too. And a lot of those people are so horrified by what's happened in yes. terms of Parliament versus the people, the anti-democratic behaviour of Remainers in Parliament, mm. uh, where they have effectively torn up various constitutional premises on which the House of Commons operates in order to force through mm. a repudiation of Brexit. And, you know, we are where we are now. We don't know how this is going to work out. But as you probably know, um, British politics has been upended by Nigel Farage and his now Brexit party, mm. which has come from nowhere to become um, a destabilising force which threatens to take votes away from the Conservative and Labour parties and wreck them. Now, what's behind that is that the people are driving this. The people want democracy and they are no longer prepared to tolerate either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party if they frustrate that. And that is now turning British politics completely on its head. We don't know how this is going to resolve itself. We don't know how this, this revolution in British politics is going to play out. In my view, it's going to take a very long time to fully understand the ramifications of this, but it has the ability to reshape British politics. And uh, the stakes couldn't be higher for um, British national independence and for the very idea of democracy itself. That's a valuable set of insights. Uh, certainly, it seems to me that one of the great issues that we now confront, though, is the lack of glue, if you like, that's bind, that, to bind ourselves together with. There was a time when we shared a much more common set of virtues, even if we didn't always live by them, that we recognised the need to respect your neighbour, even if you disagreed with them, that you argued the facts rather than demonised people and their ideas. It's In a sense, it seems to me, this terrible breakdown of trust can only be addressed by a serious restoration of the concept of a tough-minded civility where you do respect and are others enough to say that I won't denigrate you, I won't denigrate your ideas, we'll argue the facts. Mm. And this goes right back to our earlier conversation We've imbued ourselves with this idea that the facts are less important than how we feel or what is convenient. Yes, I mean, that all that is, is true. And I think two things are happening simultaneously, which are entirely contradictory. On the one hand, we are becoming much less civil. Public discourse um, is becoming almost daily more and more vicious and unhinged um, to a frightening degree. Um, at the same time, there's a backlash against that going on. And more and more people are saying, this is intolerable, we can't have this. Um, uh, there's, uh, I think, an increased appetite for proper debate, formal debate, where arguments are put and opposed in a calm way, and people can think about all this. Um, and I think some of the popularity of some people on social media, some of this astonishing popularity of people who've you know, developed millions and millions of viewers and listeners, among mainly young people, yes. is because young people, you know, they kind of, even if they've come through this terribly de degraded education system, they understand that something has, something's terribly important is missing, a connection with others, um, you know, what is life about? What is the purpose of my life? Is it really about hyper-individualism? That what I want 
is what I A should get and it will make me happy, well, we don't feel very happy. So what's gone wrong here? So you've got sort of a tremendous, I think, the, the sort of pushback is coming from a kind of blowback of misery, uh, which young people are feeling intuitively in themselves. They don't feel right. They don't feel what they're being told they should feel, which is like, everything's great. You can now do exactly what you want, so you're happy. Well, no, they're not happy. They are, they are discombobulated. They are, they are unrooted. They can't make friends. They can't find life partners. Uh, they are miserable because they've been dumped by their parents. Whatever it is, they don't even know who their birth parent is. All this misery we have inflicted upon people and they're getting on with their lives. You know, one doesn't want to exaggerate, but there's something missing. So there is the opportunity to capitalize on that and to give people again the wherewithal to connect to others and to put others first, which is, in my view, all about, you know, what, what, what the purpose of life is all about, where happiness comes, you know, not from self-actualization, but by being part of a community where you look after other people. And, you know, this is one of the great unsayables. This is a religious sense, and that's what we've lost. And it's very hard to get that back, but I believe it could be got back uh, in certain circumstances with the right kind of both religious and political and intellectual leadership. So all these things are like, if, if only, but it will never happen. And maybe it will never happen. But there you can see in these great convulsions that are going on, um, the, as I say, the, the enormous audiences being gained on social media for these some of these people. In the revolts, I would say, the Brexit revolt in Britain, uh, whatever you think of President Trump, the people who voted for Trump were thinking in the same kind of way. Uh, the people in Europe and some of those parties which are called populist uh, and racist and fascist, some of them are very nasty. Some of them should give us a great deal of cause for concern. And some of them are simply saying to people, you're entitled to your own nation and you're entitled to your own culture. And that is the essence of democracy. Um, so the revolts going on all over the West are all part and parcel of this great repudiation of this hegemonic, authoritarian, totalitarian, so-called liberal universalism, which brooks no dissent. And until the last few years, has driven everything before it. Uh, well, a comment first, and then a question arising out of that. Uh, I know that what you're saying uh, will be verified by reaction to even this conversation. Uh, we get a lot of commentary back. And one of the things that uh, I'm delighted about is that we get quite a few young people mm. tapping in saying, yeah. we're just so thankful we can go to one place and get a variety of views expressed with decency and civility. And uh, that's part of what we're trying to do. Mm. But there is that hunger out there. Very much so. And, and, and that is tremendously encouraging. Yeah. Uh, now, the question though, is uh, in the West, where are the political leaders who understand this? I was asked here in London at a talk I gave the other day, who are the global leaders that I respected in the current circumstances? I'd have to say the first one that came to my mind, because I've often thought it in recent years, is actually Queen Elizabeth II. What a remarkable figure she is and what a unifying figure she is. But when it comes to political parties grappling with things like Brexit, when you come to what's happened in America with President Trump and the extraordinary response of the Democrats, which is to harden down their own position and move even further left, are political parties capable of capturing what's happening and leading in the current circumstances? It's very hard at the moment for me, for me to think of any political leader who gets it, any political leader who is currently a leader. Um, who knows who's in the wings? You know, there may be politicians, uh, minor politicians, <clears throat> or even major politicians who are not saying what they should be saying, but who actually think like this. There might be someone listening to you who's inspired to think, when I finish at university, I'm going to see if I can't stand up. Who knows? Who knows? But That's looking why you at, speak up. <laughs> Looking at the leaders we have, um, it's very hard. I mean, I mentioned President Trump. I believe that what President Trump represents in the people who voted for him is what I'm talking about, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He gets some of it. He's patriotic. 
he understands and loves what America is, what it means to him. And what it means to him is like good things. It's freedom, um, it's decency, it's, it's all those, it's, it's the founding principles of America. Um, so that's good. But in other respects, you know, he, he clearly does not think um, about, you know, great cultural things. And he's all over the place. And he's, I would say, he was like, a, you know, basically a social liberal. That's, that's his background. So you can't look to him to save Western civilization. Um, it's the, pe the people who voted for him is another matter, but not him. I don't know. We haven't yet got a leader in the West. And that is a very significant part of the problem. We need to have a leader who will speak. Who, we need to have a statesman or statesperson who will stand above the venal immediate concerns of gaining power and will stand back and address these great cultural issues and say what needs to be said and galvanize people to do the right thing uh, over a variety of, of different issues which make up our culture. In other words, you need cultural as well as political leadership um, to, uh, to stop what has been happening, which is basically Western civilization, Western culture going over the edge of the cliff. And we're still heading in that direction, but now there's this enormous tidal force of people trying to stop us from going over the cliff. But it's very incoherent and it's leaderless. And without a leader, it's very hard to see how it's going to be stopped. I think what you just said will resonate with a lot of people. We're all trying to stop ourselves going over the abyss. How do we now pull ourselves together into a movement? Um, exactly. Uh, and uh, the, the big thing about it, though, I think, is that we need to be wary of demagogues. I, you, people say we need a benevolent dictator. Well, the trouble is they don't happen very often. If, we, uh, if we're looking for a statesman, we want it to be a true statesman or two. This is the great danger when uh, democratic societies break down. Um, you get a dictator. You get not just a dictator, you get a culture which is dictatorial stepping into the vacuum because there is a vacuum. So, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and bad people come into it. That is the great danger. And uh, we're, we're very much in that danger. I'm a deep and passionate believer in the value of history. I think it's you know, an incredibly important discipline. Uh, and I'm certain that if we better understood our own history, we'd be in a far better place than we are at the moment. But you said something recently that I'd like to just pick up on this. Uh, you were speaking of Saudi Arabia and you pointed out that the regime beheaded 37 people, mostly main, uh, minority Shiites, crucifying one of the dead and putting his body parts on public display. <coughs> Now, things like that remind us that people around the world, notwithstanding what we have in common, uh, actually have a very different approach to life and to the freedom, and their laws and institutions reflect that. Uh, most in Australia, in my country, they, they really would. They'd shrink in horror if it was suggested uh, uh, that uh, our laws would allow for those sorts of things. We wouldn't want to go there. But we seem to have forgotten that our reaction is in fact in itself a product of our Judeo-Christian Enlightenment heritage. Why have we forgotten so much that's so important? And why are we so reluctant to go back and look at it in our current confusion? It is remarkable. I mean, I'm always struck when I talk about the fact that um, the Hebrew Bible is the underpinning of Western society and has given us our, which, which gave us our freedoms. Uh, people laugh, they, they, they're incredulous, because as far as they're concerned, these freedoms, if they came from anyone, they came from the Greeks. Huh? And basically they didn't come from anybody, they came, they sort of fully formed when, we, when we're born. And that religion kind of knocks freedom out of us. Yeah. So religion is put in a box marked all bad things, it's obscurantism. Um, it's a box, mark, box marked obscurantism, uh, lack of intelligence, uh, uh, credulity, um, belief in fairies um, uh, and magic, um, and it's anti-science. And in the other box is secularism, which is the power of reason, rationality, science, freedom, all good things. And this is the opposite of the case. 
because it's only the Hebrew Bible that gave us our moral codes, which have given us freedom and equality. It's the moral, it's the Hebrew Bible, which gives us the idea that every human being is equal because made in the image of God. Other societies do not have that belief. They don't have the Hebrew Bible. They don't believe in fundamental respect for every human being's life, which we have. That comes from religion. I got challenged on that the other day by a young man, <coughs> He's a doctor, highly educated person. He said, ah, oh, you're absolutely wrong. Every religion has as its basis love and respect for other people. Every no, belief system. simply wrong. He doesn't understand. What's more, what's but even... But it's a common view. It's a very common view. And the, uh, the other, another common view is that religion is... Somehow it sits with the idea that they're all evil and have all created of course, every war of and course. every nasty thing. Of course. So the other, I, the other common view, uh, which goes along with that, is that um, religion is in the box marked reason and rationality. Uh, sorry, uh, science is in the box marked reason and rationality, and religion is anti-science. It's anti-reason, anti-rationality. But the fact is that Western science comes from the Hebrew Bible. Why? I mean, everyone goes like, what? This is ridiculous. But it's true. The, uh, the book of Genesis gave us an ordered universe governed by intelligible laws. That's what science builds on. That's what, in, when, when the Enlightenment happened, when Western science started, that's what they were doing. They were using what they considered to be God-given reason to interrogate a universe governed by natural laws. Now, there cannot be natural laws without a lawgiver. That's what the Hebrew Bible gave us. Now, it's no coincidence, therefore, that although other societies had science, they came to an end. They came to an end. They didn't go any further. They literally went round in a circle. They didn't have an idea of linear time. They didn't have an idea of progress. These are essential elements of a scientific inquiry. So, reason, justice, um, love for others, this comes from religion. Now, we've overthrown religion because we, for various reasons, we tell ourselves it's anti-science. We tell ourselves it's anti-reason. We tell ourselves that it produces hatred and division rather than love. Love of the other is only in the Hebrew Bible and in the Christianity which formed Western civilization, building on those fundamental moral precepts. That's what we've lost. So people say, well, we can't go back to religion because nobody believes in the mumbo jumbo. This is a big problem. This is a big problem, but in my view, this is another conversation. It's not an insuperable problem, but it requires religious leadership of a certain kind, which at the moment, again, big generalization, we don't generally have. Uh, we don't have religious leaders that can actually communicate what people are yearning for. See, this idea that we're in a rational universe, that, that we're in a rational society, is so ludicrous on empirical grounds. This is one of the most irrational societies that could be imagined. Well, G.K. Chesterton warned of that. Yes, but people believe in... Stop believing people in God, believe, stop believing in anything. Absolutely. And uh, that's people one believe, of the things that amazes me. People believe in anything now. There's a fad here today and there's another one over there tomorrow and people rush from one to the other and then go to some third place. But worse than that, we, are, we, believe, we, we have a society which is so uh, riddled with paganism. People believe in witchcraft. I, I can't give you the figures, but the numbers of people who are kind of in, uh, 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 um, either registering as witches, or if you register as a witch, I don't know, um, or uh, supporting witchcraft, I mean, it's going up and up. And people believe in, you know, parapsychology, healing crystals. I mean, in other words, the desire to believe in something beyond yourself yeah. is in our DNA. And either we believe um, uh, organized religion, uh, or if we, don't, if we throw that over, we believe in all this magic. We believe in magic. Um, so this is where we this is this is where we've got to. This is this is I think un, this underpins everything that that we're talking about. That you know, you can't have a society that really functions in a civilized way unless you put others first. Putting others first comes from a very particular religious tradition, which underpins Western civilization. We have, for various reasons that we've told ourselves are unchallengeable, overthrown that religious underpinning. The rest has followed. Now we have to somehow 
put all this back together again. It's going to be a tall order. It's quite simple, really. <laughs> well, one of the worst epithets that's thrown around now against people, I think, often unfairly, uh, is to accuse them of being a racist, often, and, and very often on in spurious grounds. But what worries me is that you don't see enough pushback in many Western societies against the re-emergence of a degree of anti-Semitism. One would have thought that after the horrors of the 20th century, we'd never go there again. And yet we are seeing some quite worrying attitudes redeveloping. What's driving that? Well, the many things are driving uh, the resurgence of uh, anti-Semitism in the West. Um, and uh, uh, you speak about, um, anti about, about racism being the great un unmentionable, uh, the, the, the great crime. And it is a very notable fact that in Britain, where um, the Labour Party has been engulfed by a controversy over anti-Semitism, uh, which uh, is a deepening crisis all the time for that party. Um, one of the issues there is that Jeremy Corbyn and people like him say we cannot be anti-Semitic because we are anti-racist. Now, we have to unpick this. It's a very complicated issue, but we have to unpick it because a lot of people, I think, are very confused by this whole anti-Semitism thing. Uh, when they think of, when they hear anti-Semitism, they think of Nazi jackboots. Mm. And they think, well, you know, Hitler was defeated, so what's the problem? Um, and it's further confused by the fact that so much of it takes expression as um, anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism. And people who know very little about the history of the Jewish people, very little about um, the state of Israel, very little about the Middle East, but um, who have heard a lot of propaganda uh, uh, of our, um, a sort of Arab propaganda about Israel and the Middle East, uh, they f they think perfectly reasonably within those confines. They think, well, a lot of this stuff is all about Israel, and that's not the same as being anti-Semitic. I mean, I can be anti-Israel, they say to themselves, uh, because of good reason, uh, because it is a dreadful country. And that doesn't mean I'm anti-Jew. I like Jews. I've got nothing against Jews as people. I'm therefore not an anti-Semite. And therefore, to accuse me and people like me, because of our views about Israel, of being anti-Semitic, is simply using the shield, using the Holocaust, using anti-Semitism as a kind of shield behind which they try to hide the crimes of Israel. Now, this is the great confusion that's happened, and a lot of it is fed by ignorance. Um, and one of the things I think that makes it so difficult to unpick is that, in my view, um, people who espouse a discourse which is in itself anti-Semitic may themselves not be anti-Semites. They be, may be espousing that discourse because they believe it to be true, but they themselves don't know that it's not true and that furthermore, not only is it not true, but it makes victims of people that they are really down on. Um, so, I mean, to unpick this a little bit further, what I mean by that is this, that people think that, look, here is Israel. Israel should be criticized like any other country. To say that the criticism is anti-Semitic is itself poisonous and wrong. In itself, that is true. Israel should be criticized like any other country. The problem is that it is not criticized like any other country. What I'm talking about is not criticism. It is demonization and delegitimization and dehumanization based entirely on falsehoods which people have no idea they are falsehoods because no one in Britain anyway is telling them they are falsehoods. Now, this is this anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism, by an amazing coincidence, happens to exhibit precisely the same characteristics which are unique to anti-Semitism. So let's just talk briefly about anti-Semitism because people don't understand what anti-Semitism is. 
Anti-Semitism is not a prejudice like any other prejudice. It's not just being horrible to people because they're Jews, just like you are. You look down on people because they're black or because they're gay or whatever. It's not that. Anti-Semitism is unique because it has unique characteristics which involve an obsessive focus upon Jews, a belief that they are some kind of cosmic conspiracy against the human race, a belief that they are um, bound together in this conspiracy, um, a belief that um, uh, they are responsible for crimes of which they are in fact not only innocent, but are in fact the victim. And there are other unique characteristics which make this anti-Semitism, it's called the longest hatred. It goes back to the point at which Jews became Jews, um, when through millennia of different societies which have had Jews living in them, which have not had Jews living in them, they have reacted against Jews and it's taken different forms at different times of history, um, but always with these same unique characteristics. But for example, in the Middle Ages, it took the form of um, extreme uh, Christian anti-Semitism, which was theological anti-Semitism, the belief that the Jews had killed God. And that gave rise to mass slaughter across Europe and in Britain. Um, and that, I, I encapsulate far too much in a very brief uh, answer, obviously, but that gave way in the fullness of time in the 19th century and 20th centuries to racial anti-Semitism, uh, which saw uh, the Jews not as a theological problem, but as a racial problem. So then you have the rise of Nazism, the desire to eradicate Jews as a race of people, exterminate the entire Jewish race because racially they were basically making everybody else impure and all the rest of it. And now we have a different mutation of anti-Semitism. It's not against Jews as religious unbelievers. It's not against Jews as a race of people. It is against the collective Jew in Israel. Israel is regarded as anathema in the same way that the Jews were always regarded as anathema and the same sort of characteristics. So the criticism of Israel is not criticism at all. It is a demonization which inverts the truth in an obsessive way. So everybody dwells upon Israel, whereas Israel, I mean, a moment's thought, even if it was guilty of half the human rights abuses of which it is accused, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. It is surrounded by people who, who do most appallingly barbaric things to their communities the whole time. And yet the people who are so concerned about Israel don't express any concern about that. This is what I would call obsessive and unhinged in its dwelling upon Israel. Secondly, it accuses them of crimes of which it is innocent. It thinks that um, the Jews came into the land of Israel with no connection historically, um, just a religious belief and turfed out uh, the indigenous people uh, whose relic they are proceeding to oppress today. It's completely untrue. The Jews are the only people for whom the land of Israel was ever their national kingdom. The Jews are the only people who are the extant indigenous people of the land. And they reclaimed the, late, the, the, the state of Israel was a reclamation of their ancient homeland in which they finally freed themselves of colonialist oppression, including Arab colonialist oppression, which they are still fighting. Now, all of this would come as complete news to most people because their whole frame of reference is to demonize Israel, uh, which makes it potentially the victim of not just colonialism, but genocide, because that is what is being planned for it and what its enemies in the Arab and Muslim world say all the time, get rid of it, destroy it completely, destroy every Jew who exists, Iran says, get rid of Israel, wipe it off the map, and all the rest of it. Um, and so 
um, you have a situation in which, you know, people now think that Zionism is oppressive. Zionism is simply the self-determination of the Jewish people in their ancient homeland. Um, the Jewish people in their ancient homeland are the only people who progressive opinion thinks should not have that right. What other indigenous people do progressives think should be deprived of the right to inhabit their own homeland, which only they had as a homeland, and to get rid of them, which would entail their mass slaughter? There is no other people in the world, no other country in the world treated like this. So this is just some examples, there are many more, why anti-Zionism and the kind of anti-Israelism we see is part and parcel of anti-Semitism, the mutation, modern mutation of anti-Semitism, and why it is no coincidence that the people who, um, that, that the, 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 the acceptance of this inversion of truth and falsehood when it comes to Israel has, by an amazing coincidence, unleashed the most extraordinarily virulent, old-fashioned anti-Semitic tropes um, to do with Jewish money controlling the world, Jewish money corrupting politics, the Rothschilds, bankers, Jewish bankers controlling everything, that the governments of the government of America is in the pocket of the Jews and all this pouring out. Um, so in Britain, it's being given tremendous focus by Jeremy Corbyn because Jeremy Corbyn makes no bones about the fact that he supports those who wish to exterminate the state of Israel. And he calls his friends the Hamas and the Hezbollah and so on. And he has associated himself with anti-Semitic tropes. Um, for example, uh, what really detonated this whole, this whole um, uh, concern, uh, more than I think anything else, was that he uh, lent his support to a mural in East London, which had been painted on a wall. This mural was something that could have been produced from Nazi Germany in its image. It involved caricatured hook-nosed Jews hunched over a Monopoly table, you know, the game Monopoly. And the game of Monopoly was supported on the backs of naked people who were clearly the world's poor. The message of the mural was that the Jews controlled money, which was oppressing, the, the Jews are making money on the backs, literally on the backs of the poor. How this mural got painted and put up in the first place, I don't know, but it was taken down. It was painted over. People objected, thank goodness, people objected. It was painted over. Jeremy Corbyn objected to it being painted over. He said on the grounds of free speech. Mm. When it was pointed out what he was defending, he said, I never looked at the picture. Many other examples like that abound in the Labour Party. It is now convulsed by all this. Um, but uh, it's not just in the Labour Party. We see in America, um, again, partly through um, the use of Israel as a kind of template for this anti-Jewish activity. You see um, some of the uh, new Congresswomen, uh, Democratic Congresswomen, coming out with anti-Israel statements of the kind that I've just suggested, which are irrational and bigoted and obsessional and invert the truth, associated with, in their own language, uh, stuff about uh, Jewish money buying uh, political power and safeguarding Israel. And the Democratic Party, like the Labour Party, is paralyzed by this. Why? Because it kind of supports the discourse about Zionism in Israel that lends itself to all this, and in my view, is a form of anti-Semitism. Again, I, 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 I emphasize, many people who support this discourse, who come out with it about Israel, are not, I would call, I would say they're not anti-Semites. Some of them are. Some of them are. Some of them really hate Jews. But some of them, a lot of them, are people who just, they know nothing about Jewish history, the Jewish people, the Jewish religion. They know nothing about the Middle East. All they hear what the BBC tells them, or what they read in the newspapers, all of which is lies, because all of it is fed from the Middle East by basically Arab stringers, Arab-influenced uh, Arab uh, um, uh, news agency coverage. It all seeps in. And people like me, 
who actually speak the truth about Israel and the Middle East are not given platforms in Britain in which I can, or anybody else, can say these things. So people don't know. They have no idea that the Jews are the only people for whom Israel was ever their national kingdom. They have no idea the Jews are the only indigenous people around uh, of the land of Israel. They haven't got a clue. If you say it to them, they don't believe you because they have been literally brainwashed by all this propaganda. Does that make them anti-Semites? Well, some of them are, but a lot of them are just ignorant. So the discourse is anti-Semitic. Anti it has been so much accepted as the default position in progressive circles. You know, the Palestinian Arabs are the poster children for any progressive. Um, you support pal the support of Palestine as an issue, what I would call Palestinianism, is the, the sine qua non of being a progressive. But if you support the Palestinian issue, then you are supporting stuff which many of them don't even know about, which is what pours out of, forget the Hamas, forget the Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, the so-called moderates led by Mahmoud Abbas, what pours out of that is the most disgusting Nazi-style demonization of Jews, not just Israelis, Jews, all the time. That's what all progressives are supporting when they support the Palestine cause. So if you're supporting in Palestine, in the, in the Palestine cause, if you're supporting people there who are denying the Holocaust, Mahmoud Abbas has a doctorate in Holocaust denial. If you're supporting people who say the Jews, who write the Jews out of their own history, they say the Jews were never in the land of Israel, they're writing the Jews out of their own history. You're supporting those people who are denying Judaism itself. You're supporting people who talk about Jewish money controlling the world, who talk about killing every Jew. Is it then so surprising if you're a left-wing person supporting that in the Palestinian cause? Is it so surprising that you're saying in terms of Britain and America, the Jews are controlling through their money politics and uh, turning, uh, corrupting everything in their own interests? Why is everyone so surprised? The two are absolutely connected. They are not just connected, they are the same thing. So that's what we're living through. We're living through an epidemic anti-Semitism, some of which is camouflaged lightly as anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism, epidemic anti-Semitism, and epidemic anti-Semitism denial, because people have it in their minds that anti-Semitism wears jackboots, and we got rid of that, didn't we? And so that's why we are where we are. And I would say one final thing. People think anti-Semitism is about the Jews. It is, and it's much more than that, because the signature thing about anti-Semitism, which distinguishes it from all other bigotries, is that it is a form of derangement. It is mad. It is paranoid. It is unhinged. It is obsessional. It is simply deranged. Now, a society which allows itself to become deranged over one issue is a society which has lost the plot when it comes to rationality, evidence in general. And that's what it's no coincidence we've been talking about the loss of reason in the West, the fact that evidence goes nowhere, insult has, has largely replaced argument, um, people believe in irrational things, they believe in conspiratorial things. And here you have epidemic anti-Semitism. It is not a coincidence. It is often said, you know, uh, uh, anti-Semitism, or it is often said the Jews are the canary in the mine. I'm not quite sure what the relevant analogy is, but anti-Semitism, where anti-Semitism is, is out of control, the society is, has got a death wish. Society is destroying itself. Anti-Semitism anti has always been present, always will be present, but in a society which is healthy, it's kept right under the rug. It's kept under control. It's regarded with derision and disdain. It's stigmatized. It's kept down. That's a healthy society. That's a society that wants to live. A society which has turned on itself, which has turned against 
reason itself, which has turned against decency, is a society where anti-Semitism roars out unchecked. And that's what we have. And that's one of the most, one of the single most alarming things, I think, about Western society at the moment, that the anti-Semitism that is being, that is engulfing these societies doesn't, isn't just in itself despicable and awful and dangerous and horrible. It's a signal that this society is going over the cliff. Uh, it's destroying itself. Um, and until and unless that is understood, um, neither anti-Semitism nor going over the cliff are going to be stopped. Well, that's an extraordinarily powerful outline of what we confront. Seems somehow inadequate to respond by saying that plainly we can agree that we need a restoration of a commitment to reason and evidence-based discourse. But we also need to recover, I would have thought, the key to Western harmony, which has been a genuine respect for others, regardless of whether you hold the same views. Definitely. Melanie, Thanks, you've Keith. given us a very great deal to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you, as ever, for the opportunity. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.